Okay, we are back, and this is the final lecture, lecture four for Frozen Two, and this should be um, this should be good. This should be good. I love, I love, love, love the ending for Frozen Two, or at least most of it. So, um, yeah, you'll find where I don't like it. So. Here we get to the question of we were sitting here before and we were saying at the belly of the whale, you know, um, when this when this problem emerges between the thing that your unconscious brain is telling you and we could call that sort of like a withdrawals if we're talking about habits, you know, versus what your actual brain, you know, what your conscious brain is telling you. If we're getting into this belly of the whale state where the unconscious is just absolutely destroying you, and um, and you need to figure out how to sort of well rope it together, how to sort of figure it out and how to win in the sense of behavior. You know, if we're talking about almost every single goal that you have has to do with behavior. So, you know, if we're saying you want to go to the gym, I don't know, five times a week, the, the goal is to change your behavior and your unconscious is trying to steer you in a different direction. It's trying to figure out, well, how can I get him to not go to the gym five times a week? So, you know, the question is, how could we sort of get this compromise? And, um, well, the answer actually seems like it must be compromise. That's, that's, the, that's the fundamental answer that I've, that I've come, to, come to understand. And this goes back to the study that I was telling you about before. So I'll give you the study for the people that are just joining in or have, you know, haven't, uh, didn't listen to the previous lecture. You know, a group of researchers goes up to a bunch of college students and says, hey, listen, how many times do you think you're going to work out slash go to the gym, how many hours in the next month? And they say on average 20. They bring them back the next month and the, the, that group says six, right? They, they actually say, I actually worked out six times, six hours. So, um, so there's a discrepancy there. Now they ask them, how long do you think you're going to work out for the next month? And, um, and they said 25. Right, which is absolutely illogical. It makes no sense that they set a goal that they weren't able to achieve, and then they set a higher goal. It's like it, it, it makes no sense because, well, the chances of them achieving 25 if they hit six are just about zero, almost zero, we'll say. So the question is, what should they have done? Right, that's, that's the question that we're gonna try to answer here, you know? So if we're trying to figure out what should they have done, they probably, if, if we're going to think this the right way, they probably should have said something like 10. You know, if they were sitting at 6 and they, they couldn't really achieve 6, you know, if they say 10, then they have an achievable goal, right? They have an achievable goal, and what you could do with that achievable goal is you could sit there and say, okay, if I hit 10 next month, even though that's going to be, you know, I'm going to hit my goal of 20 sometime far in the future, at least I have some goal that I'm achieving. And, you know, the best part is it feels good to achieve your goal. Imagine if you set a goal of 25 and you get 17, right? That's almost a threefold improvement, right? 3x improvement over the six that you had before. But you still feel crappy because you're like, damn it, I wish, I really wish I could have achieved my goal. So if you were to put 10 instead, instead of 25, instead of 20, if you were to just put 10, say, I want to work out 10 hours this um this month, then you're going to have positive momentum going on to the next month. And that's the way our goal structures are, are developed. It's like you achieve, you start to develop positive emotion as you start to get closer to the goal. And you start to feel very good as you start to achieve that goal. And well, if you get the reward from achieving that goal, then you're going to want to go again. You're going to, you're going to want to keep trying. So, you know, what is the reason that people failed is because they didn't work with their unconscious, right? They just sort of said, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it. Like n nothing is telling me that I can do it. So far, my unconscious has been crushing me, but I'm just gonna do it. And um, well, Elsa chooses a different path. Elsa chooses what I would say what psy psychologists believe is the better path. We could say we could say that. What she does instead of taking this this horse and this knock and um, and destroying it like you'd see in a typical like a typical superhero movie you know where the where the hero destroys the villain and then the villain dies and then that's sort of the end of it that's like the the hero 
just destroying and and um and conquering the unconscious mind. You know, it's a well, that would be the idea of working 25 hours a week, 20 25 hours a month. You know, it's like just I'm just going to beat it. I'm just going to destroy it. I'm just going to crush it. What Elsa does instead, she sort of makes like a little lasso and she controls it. Right? So, so you can see here, right? So she literally gets on the top of the horse and starts riding it and I like that idea. I really, I'm really, really starting to like that idea. It's, it's the idea of instead of saying, I am going to crush this unconscious, you say, I am going to work with it because it is a part of me. You know, like the problem that I see with the idea of, um, let's, let's see if I could pick one. We'll go with Harry Potter. You know, the problem I see with Harry Potter killing Voldemort, you know, the, the idea in Harry Potter is, um, one of them is going to die. So either at the end, the prophecy says, you know, by the time that this is over, either Harry Potter kills Voldemort or Voldemort kills Harry Potter. That's it. There's, there's nothing else. And um, the problem I see with that idea is that one must win. You know, you imagine you say that's like saying there's consciousness and then there's the unconscious. And obviously Voldemort is the unconscious and Harry Potter's consciousness. You're just saying consciousness wins. And you just kind of you just kind of repress the unconscious you just kind of you just kind of push it down and don't really deal with it you know i think it's a there's a fundamental problem there in in saying maybe maybe we should start working with it because because whenever you start to repress something like that then um well that's the idea of bottling something up you know if you bottle up your emotions right that's the exact idea of the, the hero beating the villain by saying, okay, I am going to crush this, this unconscious thought. I'm just going to push it down, push it down, push it down. I'm going to beat it. And, um, well, it gets bottled up and then eventually explodes, you know? So the idea of, um, of sort of controlling it is, is what I think is a better idea. That's the idea of saying, I'm going to work out 10 hours a week or 10 hours a month, I'm sorry. I'm gonna work out 10 hours a month. And by doing that, you and your unconscious are both working together to achieve a goal. When, well, I think that's the best way of doing it. And I, I think there's no other way of doing it. Yeah, I think I think there's almost no other way of doing it. Just telling your, your unconscious brain to shut up is, is a very tough, tough thing because you have this bottling up, bottling up effect, you know? The way, the way I like to see it is the way that I had Emerald Wilkins on, and she she explained it really well. She explained it in terms of like a garden. You imagine almost all of your um, the aspects of your personality are in a garden, right? So you imagine like you have your ego, or we'll just make it a simple garden. You know, you have your ego on one side and your personality, which is like Elsa, and then you have the horse, right? You have the unconscious mind, the dark sea on the other side, and whenever you repress one side it's as if you are well you're trying to grow this garden and it's as if you just take a tarp and you just cover it right you just cover this side because um well you're you're not giving it sunlight right you're not you're not giving it its essential nutrients to grow and um well then then you essentially lose a part of yourself you know i think the the best part that elsa realizes when she sort of lassos it is she understands that this horse you know this um this knock is actually a part of her and it it should be nurtured it should be you know treated with treated as if it's part of her and it's part of her garden it's not something that's that's on the outside and you see this idea in moana you know um so so in moana there's this is like the main villain right here. You know, this is the, um, man, how scared does this villain look, right? Like, it is the symbol of Earth Destroyer. Imagine this being like Satan, right? Or like Lucifer, something something of that effect. But the king Moana is what she does is she treats it with respect. She treats it as if it's a part of her. She treats it with respect, and um, and then it turns into this, right? The actual the villain actually transforms, and um, and well, this goes back to the idea that we were talking about before. You know, you could either see nature, right? So so this figure right here in Moana is like a goddess figure. It's like everything that's good 
in your garden, the thing that will grow your garden, you could say. And then this is the thing that will destroy your garden. And the thing is, you could look at nature as both. We were talking about this before. You could look at nature, and you could look at your nature, and you could look at the things inside of yourself as this or as this. And um, Elsa chooses to see it as this, right? When she, when she controls this horse, she doesn't kill the horse. She doesn't, she doesn't um, even try to to conquer the horse. She tries to control the horse and, and well, bring it into her reins. I like that because she's bringing it underneath her control. And I, I, I do like that idea. So um, then the knock, the knock is, it's funny because that's, that's a great way of looking at it. So then the horse actually takes her to herself, you know, and well, the meaning behind that is if not, Elsa would need to swim to Atahalan. You know, she would she would have to, she would have had to gone through the laborious, awful process of swimming. Instead, she got the reins of her unconscious and used them to take her to herself. And I'll give you I'll give you a perfect example of that. If I ask the question. Why do you want to go to the gym? You know, this is like the biggest, or why do you want to eat healthier? Why do you want to quit smoking? Why do you want to do any of this stuff? You know, uh, why do you want to get off social media? I think that's a big one. Why do you want to develop a career? You know, these are amazing questions. There are a bunch of answers that you could give me. The first answer would be, I want money, right? There's nothing unconscious about that. That's very surface level, right? That That's the equivalent of swimming, right? But then you could also say, I want to, well, there's, there's a good one. Like I want to provide for my family. It's actually a good response somewhat. I think it's, I think it's a half response, but I think it's a good response. You know, I want to, um, well, I want to contribute something to the world. I want to develop myself, develop my skills. Like these, these things are deeper motivational drives than the, than the drive for money, right? If we're going to picture ourselves as an onion, the money is just the outer layer and the deep motivational drive is what's going to take you on the inside. And, um, the best part is, you know, you'll find that if you have a deeper motivational drive, if you understand and rein in your unconscious, which is this horse, which is this deeper motivational drive, then you can actually, um, you can work with it, right? It will, it will help you, right? It will motivate you along the way because whenever you're, you're really sitting there and you're really struggling and you really don't want to work out and you really don't want to do all these things. You have this deeper motivational drive to get you there. You know, it's something that will really, really push you forward. Whenever, whenever you look at this, this money drive, you know, you could get there, right? I, I do, I do like that idea. Like you could get there. And when I say there, I mean like actual goals. I don't mean like the achievement of money, right? Getting all the money in the world. It's like achievement of some, what you'd call the good life. And this is more of a good spiritual life, you know? So you could get there through money, but you have to swim. And, um, and by taking, by taking sort of, you know, the grip of your unconscious, by, by being able to understand it and work with it and determine your motivations and, um, and use them to help achieve your goals, then, well, then it's easier, right? Then, then you're able to go and do it. Then I would say it's almost necessary. That's a good way of putting it, almost necessary. So anyways, so now we're gonna see she is traveling into herself. And when I say self, I mean, these these are her deeper motivations. These are her, um, Well, this is, this is akin to what you would call enlightenment. That's a good way of putting it. You know, this is finally being under, able to understand why you do what you do. And then also trying to understand who you are. So I think those, those are two questions. And, and once you, once you're able to do that, it's like, well, you're, you're deadly, right? Because you're able to, to handle your emotions a lot better. You know, I mean, like I spend a lot of time reading and I'm reading this book right now. It's called when, you know, and, and the idea of when is really simple. All it is, is when should you, when are the times where you should be 
where you're at your optimal productivity and when are the times where you should be socializing and how could you really balance your life? I imagine that as sort of a deep dive into myself, really trying to understand who I am and what my biology is trying to tell me. And what they say is essentially, you're very productive in the morning and you should be doing analytical work. And then from about 1 to 3 p.m., you or about six hours after you wake up, your motivation just completely dies. And, um, and that's your trough, right? Like you're literally just... You know, you, you can even notice this as you're working. Like I notice this after the fact. I'm sitting there like, wow, it's about 2 p.m. right now and I haven't gotten anything done for an hour. I've been tremendously unproductive. And then by the time like, you know, 4 p.m. to like, well, night hits, you know, you are you become a little bit more productive again, but you shouldn't be doing the, the analytical technical work. You should be doing a l- something a little bit more abstract. So when he tells me this, I sit there and I say, okay, I have a better understanding of myself now. I have traveled to something like an Atahalan, something like that. And now I've learned about some about myself. You know, there's just one hero's journey that I that I go on in my life. And um well, then I started implementing that stuff, right? So once you understand yourself, when I say that you're deadly, I say that you literally are able to manipulate your environment and manipulate your life so that you are reaching your potential is a good way of saying it. So, you know, in, in the in the choice of this book when, I've said, hey, listen, I'm going to take more breaks and I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit more relaxation during the period of one to three. You know, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna keep my analytical work in the morning and I'm gonna do, you know, probably like, you know, my abstract stuff in the in, at night. And by doing that, I reach my productivity potential, right? And then when I say, okay, what is my best time to socialize? I also could find out when, and then I reach my social potential, or at least I'm, I'm pursuing that. And well, that's why you should understand yourself. If, as you go deeper into yourself, then you start to plan and be able to, well, make your future a lot better. So this is, this is what Elsa is going to do, and you'll, you'll see it as she goes along. So she goes to find this, this self, this Atahalan, and... Um, and I like that. So, I mean, the, the lullaby has pr- essentially predicted the whole thing so far. And um, it said that Atahalan would be a river. And um, it turns out it's not a river. It's a glacier, right? It's a, it's a river of ice, as she says. And, well, this gets back to the idea of everybody else has their own path, you know? So I think everybody has a different Atahalan, you could say, because everyone has a different spirit. And, well, the reason why Elsa's... Atahalan is a river of ice. The reason why it's a glacier is because that is the self that is presented to her because, well, she's an individual. And I, I like that because she's, she's, this is only for her. This is really for no one else. And, um, and I like that. So she goes in and, um, I'll give you some lyrics. So she goes, I could sense you there like a friend I've always known. I'm arriving and it feels like I am home. So this is the song, Show Yourself. And I like that because it's just, you know, she's saying like, this this isn't just some place that she's going to, right? Like there's an actual meaning behind it. And um, this was intended by the directors that this is the place where she, that has been inside of her the whole time. You know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's where she feels like she's home, right? So she goes there. Um, let's see. Yeah, I like this. So, I mean, like, a, a nice little symbolism in here is, like, you could tell, you know, they kind of, the whole time there's this bit, there's been this little tune that's kind of been calling her, right? Sort of like a muse. And, um, and well, it's really cool because now, like, the closer she gets to herself, the closer she gets to Atta Holland, you know, the um, the more in tune she is with the with the song, with the tune, right? So it's almost as if they're synchronized, and and that's I think that's exactly what they're going for. So here, let's. Yes, I thought this is really awesome. This is really cool. So. Well, this is the idea of Alta Holland, which I really like. So it says, I have always been so different. Normal rules do not apply. Is this the day? Are you the way? I finally find out why. Right? So she's saying, I never, you know, I've, I've always known that I'm not like anyone else, which is true because none of us are like anyone else. And, um, 
and maybe today I'm going to figure out who I am, right? And that's the exact, that exact idea is mirrored in the circle of life. You know, the, the circle of life song in the, in the Lion King says, till we find our place on the path unwinding, right? So the whole idea in the Lion King is that, you know, Simba must find exactly where he sits in this giant circle of, of life, of understanding, of, you know, of careers and development and relationships. He's got to figure out all of that stuff. And, um, and the answer is you need to dive deeper into yourself. You know, I think, I think that's, that's the biggest problem that I see amongst really everything nowadays. We don't really have a plan when we do things, you know, like that's, I'll go back to the workout example. You know, when we, when we say we're going to work out 25 hours a week, we don't really have a, have a plan that really works with ourselves. And I think that's because we're such a repressive culture because we really just sit there and we don't understand who we are, right? Like we don't, we don't first say, what is the problem? And then we don't say, what is my brain telling me? Like, what does it want to do? And how can I negotiate with myself? We always say, where do I want to go? Okay, I'm going to get there. Right, and that's that's what the twenty five hours a week thing is, and and mostly that's the ego talking. Mostly that's saying, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna figure it out because, well, hopefully I can figure it out. But it, it's repressing a part of your garden. I, I like that analogy. So, um, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And if you ever find yourself frustrated with not being able to achieve your goals, it it requires something like that, something like being able to go in deeper in, into yourself and um, figuring out what it is that your unconscious brain, what it is that your, you could say your animal brain, something like that wants. And um, and we don't do that. We don't do that at all. We just kind of, we just try to override it. And I think that's, that's a huge, huge distinction. So, um, Yes, that's exactly what I was going to say in the next slide. So, you know, there's a story. It's a it's an archetypal story. It's um it's a it's a was it German? I'm going to say it was a German myth where there was this hero named Siegfried. And what he does is I think this is this is the new archetype that I really like. So what he does is he slays a dragon, right? And this is obviously very old. So he slays the dragon. And, um, and you would say that's, that's maybe the repressive culture that, that is the type that's going to work out 25 hours a week. But then what he does is he slays the dragon and then he drinks the dragon's blood and a little gross, but I mean, the symbolism behind that is he becomes one with nature. And then what happens is right after that, he hears, I think they called it the song of life. Right, so the birds start singing, and he hears the song of life. And by doing that, you know, he's, they say he slayed the dragon, right? And he, he beat himself and conquered himself. But at the same time, he embraced himself. He, he, there, it was, it's almost as if a ceremony as he, um, as he accepted the blood as part of him. And that's exactly what you do if you ever have gotten, like, the Eucharist, right, in, in uh, Christianity. Every time you have communion, you eat the bread and you are accepting God into yourself. You know, you're eating the body of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what the meaning of is drinking of their blood. You know, instead of accepting God, he's accepting his unconscious, his spiritual side. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Cause you could, you could think of the nature as it does in this movie. You know, you could think of nature as analogous to God because well, if you were to look at, the North Aldrins, the North Aldrins believe that nature is God. So, so that, that's sort of the idea. And, um, and that's what happens when Elsa steps on the, steps into the, the fifth spirit, you could say exactly what happens is she becomes one with nature, right? She unites and, um, and accepts her unconscious, right? Which is the same exact thing that you do when you drink the blood and the same thing that you do when you, um, oh yes, you do drink the blood in communion. So yes, yes, it's the same idea. Drinking the dragon's blood and drinking the holy blood is, um, it's the same idea. Just accepting that part of yourself and using it as sort of a spiritual food, right? You know, 
I like I like the idea of spiritual food. It's like you you spend so much time eating this materialistic food, you could say, you know, the thing that's going to keep you alive. But what's the thing that's going to help you live? You know, I hope you could tell the difference. And it's it's the spiritual food. So she steps in there. Um, I like I like what they did here with the you can see the little circles that are going around her dress. And it's like the, the elements of nature actually like integrate themselves as part of her dress. And and that's the entire meaning behind it. They they literally are um, becoming her, right? There there's a full unification between between the individual and nature. And um, well, this is the essential drinking of the the blood of Christ or drinking of the blood of the dragon. It's a, it's that's what she's doing. She's unifying herself with nature. She's unifying herself with God. And um, step into your power. That's a. If we were to take it out of the cultural context, I think that's the right idea. Step into your power. Step into you know your nature is your power. God is your power. Spirituality is your power. And um, your unconscious is your power. And you could use the tools of your unconscious to be able to, well, first go deeper into yourself and also to achieve your goals. So um. So yes, then we have, so that's that's sort of the end. It's called the apotheosis, you know, the, the confrontation at the end. You know, you start to figure out, okay, who am I, right? And then now, this is the question of what are my goals, right? So she just figured out who she is. Now she must figure out what am I to do? You know, how am I going to find my place on this path unwinding, as you just say in the circle of life? And, um... Well, it's this atonement with the mother. I actually, I actually kind of like this idea. I, I watched the docu series that they put after it on Disney Plus, and apparently this was a late edition. But I, I really like what they did here, actually. So what they're doing here is they're saying that you know, well, this gets back to the idea before of how Elsa's mom tried to achieve a goal, which is uniting them with the North Aldrins. Right or uniting the Northodrians and the Arendellians, and she failed, right? So it's it's actually somewhat significant that she goes into herself and she sees her mother, right? And um, and the message here, right? Well, clearly is you know, and you see right like there's also the scene of her rescuing the her father, and you know what it, what it's saying here is. I have done something and I failed, right? My goals, right? Me, like the me that is inside of me is getting passed down to you and as well as my goals. My goals are also getting passed down to you. And that's really what the mother symbolizes here, you know? It's the, I messed up, I failed, but you could you could help me out here. And that's from a, you know, Jordan Peterson talks about this in Pinocchio, right? In Pinocchio, Pinocchio saves his father from the belly of the whale. You know, and he goes into the belly of the whale, saves his father and, 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 um, and brings him out. And I think this is the exact same archetype. It's the exact same thing where Elsa goes into herself, which is the symbol of the belly, right? She goes deeper into herself and she rescues her mother's goals from, well, you could say deep in the belly of the whale, right? So by saying that, and also, you know, they, um, yeah, like they say, they say that it's the source of her powers, which is a little bit unclear, you know, Atahalan is the source of her powers, which is the same thing as Pinocchio, you know, in Pinocchio, um, there's this idea that the mother was the one who gave, um, that, Geppetto is the one who gave Pinocchio the powers, right? Because he was such a good guy. And it's kind of the same way with the mother. Because the mother was so good, she gave her powers to Pin uh, to Elsa. So the, there's this there's this Pinocchio vibe that's sort of going on. And um, and then that's, that's what the end goal is. So the mom was the one who gave the powers to um, Elsa, right? And therefore... It's her job to achieve the goals of, of the future. And I mean, they just described so perfectly there, 
what genes are like genetic expression being able to transfer your genes on to the to the future you know the idea jordan peterson says this the idea of rescuing the belly of the whale rescuing your father from the belly of the whale is going deep into the we'll say skills traits and um and talents of your parents right and um and rescuing them right and and integrating them into your own personality so i mean if we're to think about it right the best part about our parents right is that they did something good to be able to well first of all make it up to the point of maturity and then also be reproductively successful you know like that's that's not an easy thing and um well every single one of our ancestors has done that for the past three million years you know roughly and um and it's like there are so many skills, traits, all these things that exist in your genes that you just haven't figured out yet. You know, like maybe maybe one of your ancestors, you know, a hundred years ago was a really good artist. And, you know, you want to be an artist. So you go deeper into yourself and then you find deeper into your unconscious. You actually have some genes that make you a good artist. You know, that's that's sort of the idea here. And um and there's something good in that because then you could actually you actually realize that you have skills and and more likely than not you actually do have skills because once again your parents were you know your ancestors were all very reproductively successful so i like that um another archetype that jordan peterson says um that he puts in here is this is sort of the w awakening of tradition right so you'd imagine the the mother is a symbol for, actually, no, I wouldn't say she's a symbol of tradition, so I'll scratch that. I would say the father's the symbol of tradition in this movie, and, well, she doesn't see her father. So, anyways, um, yeah, I like that. This is just another way to prove it. You know, if you look at the background of this picture over here, then what you'll see is it's pictures of her own self. So it just kind of shows that she's going deeper into her own her own motivations, her own memories, and, um, oh, here's the, here's the apotheosis, you know, here's... Um, well, yeah, she finds out, I think, you know, I've said this like multiple times. She goes in deeper to herself. She finds that the person standing at the star is her and she's the fifth spirit because it's the combination of individuals in nature. So go there. Um, the next step is you, you experience a sort of spiritual transformation. And, um, well, I like that. So, so what's the idea of the transformation? The idea of the transformation is you're actually going to use the things that you've learned to help you in your life. You know, it actually must change your personality because if you learn something about yourself and you don't do anything about it, you know, that's the, uh, that's the equivalent of me reading that book when, you know, and, um, and not well changing my routines, changing my, my habits, changing my, um, when I work throughout the day. And, um, well, the thing is, if you don't do that, then it's almost a waste. It's almost a waste because, well, I like the idea of knowing is half the battle, you know? Actually, well, so there's, um, what, what's her name? Lori, oh, Lori DeSantos, I think it's called. I think that's her name. She, she has a podcast called The Happiness Lab, and she told me about this thing called the G.I. Joe fallacy, right? G.I. Joe is a, it's a TV show. It was an old TV show, and what they would say is, um, they'd have this, they'd have this entire TV show, and then at the end, you know, sort of at the end credits, the there would be, you know, GI Joe, the soldier, right? The the we could call him the role model for for all these little kids. You know, after he just did all of his heroic things, he would go in and um, he would do something heroic to a little kid. You know, he'd like he'd save them from a uh, from crossing the street and walking when a car was going by, or like. I don't know, we'd tell them to wash their hands, something like that. And there there was always this line that they always ended it on. It was, um, the little kid would say, and now I know, and knowing is half the battle, right? Or G.I. Joe would say, knowing is half the battle. And, um, and well, a group of psychologists, you know, Lori DeSantos, she's at Yale, right? And she came together and she found that knowing is not half the battle. Knowing is... <laughs> It's about 10% of the battle. That's what they found. Being able to make a transformational change in your life is, um, well, knowing that you need to make the change 
is about 10% of the battle. 90% of it is action. 90% of it is actually going through this process of confronting yourself and, um, and well, learning and being able to manipulate your action to change it. And, um, well, that's the idea. You know, like 70% of smokers who want to quit but can't, you know, 70% of smokers want to quit, but they literally just don't. And um, it's because 70% of smokers know, right? They, they understand that what they're doing is wrong. But that, again, that's only half, that's that's 10% of the battle. Action is the next part. So, so being able to transform not only your... Um, yourself right like your your mental state emotional state but also being able to change your actions in in the in the understanding of goals that's that's the most important part and um well okay so there's a little bit more here and I'll, I'll i'll try to explain it here but it's i find it somewhat irrelevant so um so then what happens is she they tell her don't go deeper in oh no so then so, okay, this is pretty cool, actually. So you go, you know, she has this moment and she actually goes down deeper into her own memories, which it's kind of what you're doing as you, um, as you're going deeper into yourself because you're, well, understanding your, everything that's led you there and you're using your experiences to change your future, right? And, and get a better understanding of the world, you know? Imagine trying to, well, we'll talk about it in quitting smoking, for example. You know, you say you're gonna quit smoking and it's so easy to just go there and say, okay, I'm gonna quit, right? Like, I, I have this realization that I'm gonna go and quit. Well, the next thing that you gotta do is dig back into your memories and say, okay, how am I gonna do that? Let's look into my memories. I tried this way, it didn't work. Tried this way, it didn't work. And you use your own experiences to sort of, to sort of shift the way that you orient yourself in the world. And, um, and that's exactly what Elsa's doing here. So she sees her parents, which is, which is cool, I think, because, you know, she, not only is she seeing the things that she's seen, but she's seeing what's the equivalent of her genetic expression, right? The things that happened to her in the past. So, um... So I like that. The things that happened to her and her parents in the past because they are now a part of her because they are part of her genes. And also, therefore, she sees her grandparents and her grandpa. Then she goes in deeper. And um, and while this is somewhat akin to the to the transformation, you know, she goes in and she finds out that her her grandpa's evil, which I mean, this is sort of like a second ending, which I which I really think is like unnecessary. I think I think we could have ended the whole thing right at the end of this movie and i think you know obviously there'd be some loose plot points but they could have cut off those plot points and i would have been satisfied the second ending doesn't really make me satisfied but she goes in deeper into herself and um there's this idea not too far or you'll be drowned and um well the idea behind that is and i i really this is this is why i think it's actually important so so i'll go with this and i'll probably end it right there um The idea behind it is when you go down deeper into your own memories, when you go down deeper into your own past, when you go down deeper into your own self, your unconscious brain, you'll find that you've been repressing things for so long. You've, you'll find that, well, I'll give you, I'll give you this story of Fight Club. You know, Fight Club, Fight Club's actually a pretty good example. As you go through, you know, there's this idea that um, that he was the, the main character was too um, nice. You could say he's like Mister Nice Guy. You could say, and he wasn't he wasn't really getting anything out of it. So somebody, which is a figure of his unconscious, comes in and he says, "Punch me, right? Just punch me." And um, this anger that you've been repressing your whole life, just let it out, right? Just just do it, right? And um, you could say that he's becoming more of himself because he doesn't really want to be Mr. Nice Guy. He's not happy being Mr. Nice Guy. And he's able to sort of, well, embrace a part of himself that gets him closer to his goals. You know, you could imagine that in sort of like the, the garden metaphor. He's been, he's been repressing this sort of anger 
um, side of his garden, and he's actually taking the tarp, the tarp off, which is pretty nice. You know, he's actually starting to um, encounter a different part of himself that that he probably should have seen. But the problem with that is he gets punched in the face, right? The problem with with um, becoming aggressive is that you you actually get punched in the face, and I like that idea because there's a reason you've been repressing it, right? Like any any thought that you've been repressing. Um, There's a reason why you originally did it. And as you go deeper into yourself, as you start to understand, as you start to pull out all these tarps, well, not only do you encounter the great experience of understanding yourself, but you encounter the negative experience of, well, experiencing the thing that you've been repressing your whole life and pushing down. So um, so that's the idea of, of not too far or you'll be drowned. And... Um, well, I think that's all I care about, to be honest. So there's this whole thing with Anna. I really don't care about Anna. Um, they burn down the... They, they take down the bridge. Um, they take down the dam, right? That's sort of like a transformational experience. And they're united with the forces of nature, right? So, so they sort of... Um, do you see this thing in the sky? And... The, the fifth spirit sort of shows itself. And it's like, all right, good. The individual and nature are now one. Good. Um, I really didn't like the ending, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be too hard on it. And, okay. And then here's the last part that I like. So this is the end where um, there's this really good archetype that I like. It's called the master of two worlds. And um, you, you, gotta, you gotta think about it in terms of, you know, the transformation that happens after you start to understand yourself, you know? So Elsa realized that she really does not want to be queen, right? She understands that, you know, the, the idea in The Lion King is Simba isn't king, but he was meant to be king, and in, at the end of the movie, he becomes king, right? It's like he never really contemplated whether or not he wanted to be an artist, for example, right? If we're just going to go with something. But, but Elsa... Um, you know, like Elsa takes us a step further in Frozen 2 where she says, all right, I've understood myself. I've really figured everything out and um, and I don't want to be queen. Like the thing that I've been set up to do, I'm not going to be. And you could imagine that as sort of, you know, every single, I, I like to look at that in terms of career because, well, it's it's pretty correlative. I mean, you look at almost every parent wants their kid to do what they've done because, well, First of all, it's kind of a shoe in right? Because um, the parent is skilled at that thing, so all you have to do is essentially reach into your parents, um, reach into your parents' genetic expression for their skills, and um, and use that. It's it doesn't take too much too much thinking, too much self exploration. But but to go in and say, hey, listen, even though my dad is good at accounting, you know, or a great lawyer. I want to really go and be an artist. You know, that's that's a great idea. And um, here's the thing that I really, really want to do. But I'm gonna to have to go back a lot further in the in the human evolutionary chain to do that. And it's it's a lot more difficult. But being able to do that is transformative. And um, and that's what Elsa does here. You know, she she essentially says, "Hey, listen, I'm, I'm I could live the world of um, of." being normal and, and dealing with everybody in society. But at the same time, I have this calling to go be an artist. I have this calling to go do what I actually want to do in my life. And um, and it doesn't, it's not being the Lion King. It's not being the Queen of Arendelle. You know, it's, um, it's deeper than that. So I think that's a good place to end it in saying that, you know what? She is transformed to the point where she understands that she's, she could break away from society, but still be able to manage the two, and that's that's usually what ends up happening. You, know, you can't you can't normally just kind of screw off and say, "All right, I'm just I'm just not going to deal with society anymore." You know, very very few people are actually able to do that. You gotta you know you could sort of integrate. You know, you could sort of do both by by digging in deeper into yourself, but also being able to um, well not be an accountant, but be you know. 
but still talk to the accountants and still, you know, be with your family and things like that, you know, by being able to do that, it's, it's so much easier. So that is the end of Frozen 2. Um, yeah, that is the end of Frozen 2. Um, I just wanted to plug my book at the end because, well, this entire lecture series is based off my book. This entire lecture series is exactly what my book is about. You know, it says break your bad habits in 150 pages, a hero's journey. And, you know, I just think it's nice because we watch all these people go on these hero's journeys. We watch Elsa go on our own, on their own hero's journeys, but then we sit back and say, maybe we could go on our own, you know, like maybe, maybe this, this movie actually means something and it can, um, it could, you could use the same process, the same hero's journey that Elsa goes on to help you break your bad habits. And well, I devised an entire system, ex essentially extracting the entire hero's journey and just applying it to bad habits. And, um, and I hope, I hope it, the link is on Amazon. It's going to be below. And I hope that you could use it to break any bad habits you're struggling with. So thank you.